All right, so we finished up last time talking about the female reproductive structures and ducts and pathways for that egg to travel and where it implants. So every month, the ovaries undergo a cycle, and it's driven by hormones, what the ovary is going to do during the cycle. So it's typically a 28-day cycle, and it's broken up into the ovarian cycle, which overlaps with the uterine cycle. So what's going on, remember the ovaries are what's producing the hormones, right? So the hormones act locally on the ovary to develop and ovulate an egg, and at the same time, those hormones act in the bloodstream and the uterus to prepare the uterus for a potentially egg that's going to implant. So both of these are occurring at the same time, the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle under the influence of estrogen and progesterone. Okay. So we talked about when we look at the ovarian cycle, so the, the ovary, what's happening there, the first 14 days is the follicular phase. And that's where the follicle's developing. So the hormones, estrogen and progesterone, are developing that follicle, getting that egg ready to be released from the surface of the ovary, and we call that ovulation. So the follicular phase ends with ovulation. And make sure that you highlight that, because that's a key concept for the follicular phase. It ends with ovulation. So it's ovulated, and where does that secondary oocyte with the corona radiata and the zona pellucida around it, where does it get ovulated to? Where does it hang out waiting for the sperm? The uterine tube, yep, or the oviduct, yep. So the fimbrae wafted in there, right? And sometimes we said the fimbrae don't do that effectively and it ends up somewhere else and that's gonna be a failed possible pregnancy, right? Or sometimes it stays in the oviduct and never travels down to the uterus to implant and that's called an ectopic pregnancy and that will rupture that oviduct. And that'll be an emergency room visit for that female. Okay, so ovulation then is just the rupturing of that follicle, releasing the secondary oocyte. Remember, it's stuck in metaphase two of meiosis, so it hasn't finished that final division yet until the sperm actually penetrates and fuses with the nucleus. But the empty follicle then becomes this structure, which is called the corpus luteum. Yep, and we said that that produces a lot of hormone for the first three months until the placenta grows from the implanted oocyte that's been, uh, been fertilized, the implanted ovum which is called the blastocyst, which we'll talk about in lab this week. Um, so this is secreting a lot of hormone, and it's going to the blood. And some people, some women, there's a vomiting center in the hypothalamus that is constantly sampling the blood for foreign things. So if you, like, classic one is my two-year-old, um, or I think it was one and a half, um, drank strawberry soap. He comes out, and there was, like, a little bit of soap. I added water to it, you know, because it gets low, and then you add a little water to get your hands clean. And I come, and he comes up to me, cap is off, and it's empty. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So I smell his breath. Sure enough, strawberry soap. I'm like, oh. Yes, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm like, now what? So I call the poison control center, and they said, don't worry about it. Soap is something that triggers vomiting naturally, so he'll be vomiting it up, you know, pretty soon. Like, okay, great. So he's just playing with toys and just kind of toddling around. All pretty soon he's, mm, mm. and then up it came. So, but that's the good news about the hypothalamus. It's sampling the blood and saying, ooh, we got chemicals in here that don't belong. Get rid of it out of the stomach, right? Well, the same thing happens with people in the first three months of pregnancy. There's all these extra hormones higher hormone levels, plus the extra hormones of the implanted blastocyst, HCG, and the hypothalamus says, what is this about? Trigger vomiting. And how do those people feel? How, how many of you in here have kids that had this issue in the first three months? Anybody? Yes? What can you tell us? What were your days like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that vomiting center is constantly being triggered. That's the hypothalamus in some women that is just hypersensitive to those pregnancy hormones. Yeah. And it's really important that those women do whatever they can to try to keep food down because you can get dehydrated during this time. People sometimes end up in the hospital on IV fluids. Um, they say salt helps. Um, I don't know if it's just 
you know, desensitizes the hypothalamus or helps the stomach lining, you know, you know, cope with nausea better. I'm not sure, but um, it's a big problem. I did not have that problem in my pregnancy. It's probably why I went on to have six kids, and it's probably why I gained 50 pounds in all my pregnancies because I just loved food during pregnancy. So because it also heightens your sense of smell. So some people have more food aversion, certain things that they used to like they can't stand because of the smell, right? But other people, foods they enjoy taste really good when you're pregnant. Anybody have that experience, that you enjoyed food more when you were pregnant? No? No? You, say you had the issues of not liking food. OK, well, anyway, so that's what that's about. So. Ovulation ends the follicular phase. We have the luteus, a corpus luteum. So that's the luteal phase. So from days 14 to days 28, we say about 28 days for a cycle, the corpus luteum is secreting progesterone and estrogen. And that, those hormones, again, are acting on the uterus and causing it to build up and get ready for an implanted blastocyst, that, that fertilized ovum that's been fertilized by the sperm. But if there's no pregnancy, so there's no implantation of a blastocyst, then that causes the cycle to complete. And that corpus luteum becomes the corpus albicans, right? And then all that extra hormone decreases. So here is what we see when we look at um, those gonadotropins. You remember gonadotropins are tropic hormones that act on the gonads. So where does LH and FSH come from? Do you remember? Say it louder. Yeah, the anterior pituitary. So the anterior pituitary secretes this FSH and LH. And notice there's a surge of LH right at the end of the follicular phase. So here's the follicular phase the, in blue. And this is the luteal phase in green. So right at the end of the follicular phase is this huge surge of LH from the anterior pituitary. And that stimulates ovulation. So that's when the ovary releases the egg is when there's this LH surge. So this is why some women who are having trouble predicting when, when they actually ovulate, because that egg is only good for 24 hours and then it breaks down. Maybe 36 if you're lucky, but 24 is pretty much the average. So if intercourse and sperm are not available in that 24-hour window when a couple is trying to conceive, that's it for that month. Now you're going to wait another month before the woman ovulates again. So what they have are ovulation test kits, which is just like a pregnancy kit. A woman tests her urine early in the morning is when this LH is the highest. So right when the woman gets up in the morning, she tests her urine for this LH surge. And that means ovulation will happen within the next 24 hours. So you can buy them at the dollar store, progesterone, or not progesterone, LH ovulation kits, and then the pregnancy tests too. Um, they're very sensitive, very accurate. So then a, a couple knows that they should plan intercourse as soon as they see the LH surge, because the egg will be ovulated. And, and the ideal scenario is to have the sperm there waiting, because the sperm can live in the female reproductive tract for up to seven days. So when that egg is ovulated, the sperm are there, and fertilization can take place. So that's the, the LH surge that stimulates ovulation. That's a key concept that you should remember. So this kind of just summarizes everything that's going on within the ovary. So we have the follicular phase ending with ovulation caused by that LH surge, and then the corpus luteum, eventually the corpus albicans. So the uterine cycle then is what's going on with that uterine lining. And the, uter the uterine lining is the endometrium. So the endometrium is what we're talking about that's changing throughout the cycle. So days one through five is when active bleeding is occurring. And I'll choose red appropriately. So when a female notices red blood, that's day one of the cycle, the first day that she sees red blood. So brown spotting does not indicate day one. Some women start their cycle with little bits of brown spotting, which is old blood. That's not active shedding of the endometrium yet. So when they see red blood, no matter what, how much it is, that's day one of the cycle. 
And a woman usually bleeds from one to five days. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. Every woman is different. Uh, females, like I said, with endometriosis that have abnormal thickening of the uterine lining will bleed more. Um, and those that are on, say, birth control pills that are um, not taking the pill during that short period of time when they want the menstrual period to happen, um, they'll, breed, they'll bleed very light because the hormones in birth control pills prevent the thickening of the uterine lining. So they're going to have lighter periods. And some birth control, like uh, the Mirena is a real popular one used among young people or people with really heavy periods. Sometimes they don't get a period at all with the Mirena. So that, that menstrual um, or that uterine lining doesn't thicken. So then we have the bleeding occurring and then the building up phase. So days 6 through 14, the uterine lining is building up. Because what happens on day 14 from the ovary? What? Ovulation. Yeah, so ovulation happens at day 14. We have a nice thick uterine lining ready to nourish and nurture that developing zygote. So that's what happens in that first 14. So it's all about getting ready for a potential pregnancy. Then another two weeks depends on what happens, right? Either the corpus luteum is maintaining that lining or over the next 10 days that lining is going to break down and it's going to be shed and that starts the next cycle of menstrual bleeding. So looking at the uterine lining, here's the shedding in the first five days. This is the menstrual phase. Then we have ovulation, or uh, we have the follicular phase going. We're building up the follicle, thickening up this lining. Ovulation occurs. We have a nice thick lining. It'll continue to thicken if the corpus luteum is supporting, the hormones of the corpus luteum is supporting that thickening. If not, again, after 10 days, it's going to drop because the corpus albicans is now no longer secreting the hormone because it's the corpus albicans, and then we have menstrual bleeding again occurring. So what's happening in this first part here? As we get close to ovulation, some things change in other parts of the reproductive tract. The cervical mucus gets thinner and becomes more alkaline. What would be the benefit of having cervical mucus be more alkaline? Higher pH. Again, the goal of the reproductive system is to make sure sperm and egg meet each other successfully. Well, acidic cervical mucus and vaginal secretions, what is the benefit of that to the female? Thinking outside the reproductive system, what is the benefit, do you think, of having an acidic environment in the vaginal canal and the cervical canal? What? Yeah, to prevent bacterial infections, definitely. So when we have an acidic environment, that means we're protecting that from infection. And, the, and protecting the uterus from infection. So when we get near ovulation, though, we don't want that acidic environment because what do we know about sperm? Yeah, acid kills sperm. So sperm prefer an alkaline environment. Remember when you studied the male reproductive tract? A lot of secretions were alkaline to, to nurture the sperm as they pass through. So the same thing is happening in the female then. It's becoming an alkaline environment and the the Cervical mucus is very thin, uh, more watery, so the sperm can swim. Outside of that, the cervical mucus is typically a little more sticky, thicker, and acidic. So that's not promoting um, fertilization because it's, the egg's not ready, so why bother, right? So when the egg is getting, becoming available, all these things change. And then um, women also, like we look in the animal world, but it works with humans too, women also, the libido goes up during the ovulatory phase. Libido, do people, does everybody know what that means? Not everybody does. The sex drive, the desire for intercourse, right? That goes up near ovulation because, again, we're trying to promote sperm and egg, right? So um, men, we give off pheromones. Males can detect that in the people around them. They've done studies and found that, that the men kind of know when a woman is ovulating. So, because we give off pheromones. Animals do the same thing, right? How do the deer come out of nowhere when the, when the, um, the does are ready to be fertilized, right? So this process of these hormones are supporting this 
um, ovulation and making sure that intercourse occurs. All right, so if fertilization does not occur, we said that corpus luteum breaks down, the progesterone levels fall. So keeping progesterone levels high supports the uterus. So progesterone makes the uterus happy. It quiets the uterus, prevents contractions, and it keeps the uterus nice and thick. So some women I mentioned last time we were in class have low progesterone levels at the start of pregnancy, and that can lead to early pregnancy losses. So it's really important if a newly pregnant female notices some bleeding to go and be evaluated right away and ask for a progesterone level because sometimes doctors don't look for that and a woman can have multiple pregnancy losses that could have been avoided if they just supplemented with a little progesterone. All right, so, but fertilization didn't occur, so progesterone levels are falling. The spiral arteries that serve the uterus kink and spasm, endometrial cells die, and then those spiral arteries dilate and open up, and there's a lot of bleeding that takes place, and we see blood coming from that endometrium as it breaks down. So end endometrial cells and bleeding occur in that first five days. <clears throat> so if a person is looking at when is the fertile period, <clears throat> for a female who wants to become pregnant, because at some point in some of your lives in this class, whether you're male or female, you're going to be concerned about this if you're thinking of having a family. So understanding how the uterine cycle works is really important. When is the most fertile period? If you look at this 28-day cycle, when is the most fertile period when a couple should plan intercourse? What? Day 14 and 15? We said sperm can live in the female reproductive tract for seven days. So day, yeah, even day seven. Yeah, as early as day seven. So is a, is a woman thinking when she just finished her period, is she thinking, I'm fertile right now? Probably not. And that's probably why we have some unplanned pregnancies, right? <laughs> because that's when it happens, is in that first half of the cycle, right after the menstrual period, is when people are um, fertile. And some people think, oh, I'm on my period, I'm not going to get pregnant, we don't need protection. Definitely not true, definitely not true. So <clears throat> then, ovulation sometimes can cause pain in some women. Some women know when they're ovulating. They get right-sided pain on the lower left or the lower right, and the ovaries kind of switch back and forth on which one releases the egg. Sometimes it's left, left, right, right, left, right. There's no real rhyme or reason to it, but they take turns. And some people have lost an ovary due to an ectopic pregnancy, so that just the other one is gonna be ovulating, right? But either way, some people have pain with that. And when I taught uh, health over at UWL, I sometimes had um, college students come up after class and say, you know, I've got this pain, it kind of comes and goes, it's on the right side, and it hurts when I sit down or if I stand up, it, then it goes away. Like, that sounds like ovulation pain. And you'll know it's ovulation, for the girls in here, you'll know it's ovulation pain um, when it lasts about 24 hours, and then it's just suddenly gone. You have this horrible aching pain not associated with the menstrual period. Um, if you're not on a birth control that suppresses this whole process, um, you get the bad aching pain on one side or the other, lasts about 24 hours, sometimes as little as 12 hours, and then it's just gone. And that's middle schmers, or we call it, it's German for middle pain, middle schmers and that's ovulation pain. And some people find it helpful because they can kind of plan, um, you know, do family planning around that. Okay, so there's three phases to the uh, uterine cycle, the menstrual, proliferative, and secretory, and then the ovarian phase is just the two, the follicular and the luteal phase. And again, they coincide with each other. So any questions about that before we kind of switch gears and talk about the next topic? Okay, <clears throat> so developmental aspects of the reproductive system. So how do we develop into male and female? So two months before birth, testosterone secreted from the testes causes the migration of the testes that are in the pelvic cavity to migrate into the scrotal sac. So the testes are in the abdominal cavity two months before birth and then they work their way down into the scrotal sac. So have you, like I show dogs, and a big thing in dogs is that your dogs that you show in the show ring can't be 
neutered or spayed. They have to be intact to show their, their goods, right? So for the males, if you have a, an awesome male dog that you've bred and has this great look to it, it totally fits the breed standard, but the testy didn't descend into the scrotal sac, it's a very common problem. That dog is not show quality and now it's a pet. So it's a big deal. And there are human males that are born without a descended testy, and they will have to go up and do surgery to get it down. Sometimes it happens on its own. Other times they have to go and, and go get it. So there's a special structure called the gubernaculum, and that's a term you should know, which helps guide that descent. So the same thing happens. Um, to the ovary. The ovary is pulled down as well, but there is no scrotal sac and no pathway for that ovary to continue on outside the body, so the ovary stays in the pelvic cavity where the testes goes all the way down into the scrotal sac. So there's this ligament that kind of stops the path of those ovaries. So we know that there's 23 pairs of chromosomes. Oh, and there was an error. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Jessica, um, on the, what do we call it, the interactive iPad quiz, right? There was a question about um, how many chromos homologous chromosomes there are. There's 22, not 23, so I fixed that. No, I actually just took the question out and gave everybody extra credit, so if you got it right, you got extra credit on it, so it didn't hurt your grade. Okay, so there's 23 pairs of chromosomes. We talked about the 23rd pair are the sex chromosomes, right? XX or XY, so we know that there's a lot of traits on that X chromosomes, the sex link traits, right? Like color blindness, hemophilia, uh, muscular dystrophy, that's on the X chromosome. And then the Y chromosome is a really short little chromosome that has not a whole lot of traits on it other than making boy parts. So there's a gene on the Y chromosome that is called the SRY gene. And that is what codes for protein synthesis and male development. So this SRY gene kicks in at a certain point in fetal development. So the lack of an SRY gene means it's going to be a female fetus. So there is a stage in which we can't tell if that embryo is going to be a male or female, it's called a sexually indifferent phase. And that's at stages five to six weeks is when we start to see things developing, but both parts are there. So if we look at um, the right side, there's two different ducts. And I want you to know the ones in the parentheses. I think that's a little easier to remember. Um, the Wolfian duct and the Malarian ducts. Those are the ducts that will develop into male and female parts, the reproductive tract. So we have the Wolfian duct and the Malarian duct. So the Wolfian duct is going to, when those develop, that becomes male parts. When the Malarian ducts develop, that becomes female parts. So both are present at the fifth and sixth week stage of de development in this embryo. So we say it's sexually indifferent because we don't know what it's going to be because both are there. So then, about seven to eight weeks, what we find is the malarian ducts degenerate and the wolfian ducts start forming the ductus deferens and the male parts of the reproductive system. So this is if the SRY gene is present. So if that's present, we start to see this development taking place. And again, this is the Wolfian duct, which is called the mesonephric. In females, that kicks in about eight to nine weeks. So if there's no SRY gene, then the 
the malarian ducts develop, and the Wolfian ducts degenerate. <coughs> and we have a female. So are there errors in um, DNA that cause problems where people develop with both parts? Have you heard of that? What? What did you? Oh. Oh, really? I haven't heard of that before. I know there is a part, there are people that have an X, two X chromosomes and a Y, and sometimes they, they so they're, they're female primarily, but they have external male anatomy that never develops. So they have, um, but because of the, the extra chromosome, they are infertile. So um, rumor on the street is that Jamie Lee Curtis was born with that condition. Do you know who Jamie Lee Curtis is? Yeah. So um, they're mostly female, but they have external male anatomy. So what has happened years ago, before we knew all about all this stuff, you know, in the 1800s and early 1900s, what would you call a child that's born with male reproductive parts? You'd call them a male, right? But actually, they're more female based on the X chromosomes and all the characteristics associated with the X chromosomes, um, and they have more female characteristics, but they have the male anatomy. So what do we do now? Now we do genetic testing to see what's going on with these individuals, and then we you know, make adjustments with surgery or whatever, or hormones. So, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of talk about gender, right, where people say, you know, you're male, female, binary, and all these choices, and a lot of that is driven, driven by DNA. So it's not just, you know, people making some of this stuff up, as some people criticize, you know, if you look at both sides of the fence. Some of this is medically based in where they're having the gender, you know, kind of neutral, um, parts and things, so. But infertility often goes along with that. So if we look at these early reproductive structures, like the genital tubercle, that will develop, if the SRY gene is present, that will develop into a male penis. If not, it'll develop into the clitoris of the female. So it's the same tissue. And if you remember back in general A and P, when you looked at that tissue in the female, it was made up, the, up of the same uh, corpus cavernosa which causes erection in the penis. It also causes erection of the clitoris when stimulated. There's a lot of sensory endings on the penis and on the clitoris, so it's because they develop from the same tissue. And there is something that um, happens in uh, countries where women are oppressed, and it's called um, female castration. Have you heard of that? Where they remove the clitoris, so she, the female is not likely to enjoy intercourse and won't cheat on her partner. And that's you know a terrible thing, obviously. It's mutilation. The urethral folds, another early de developmental structure, will develop into the urethra of the male and the labia minora of the female. And the labia minora of the female, remember, are the inner darker folds that do not grow pubic hair. So those two tissues are related. They develop from the same early tissue. And then the labioscrotal folds, the labia majora, so the larger folds over the vaginal opening that do grow pubic hair, that is from the same tissue as the scrotum of the male. So why do we look at all this stuff? Well, sometimes people, you know, abort. And when we say abort, that is something that can happen spontaneously. So older fetuses, when they are miscarried, we call that spontaneous abortion. We don't, it's not like a medical where they went to a clinic and had the baby removed. It's, just, it's the medical term for later miscarriages. Um, sometimes these parts are not fully developed, so we can kind of assess where, how far along a fetus is by looking at these parts and where they are in development, because we know at certain stages, you know, these reproductive parts show up. All right, so um, talked about that already. So let's talk about the other end of the spectrum. So that's the early part of development. Now we'll talk about the later part. Um, around age 50 is when the ovaries start to become less responsive to the gonadotropins. And what did we say the gonadotropins were?
hormones from what organ? Say it, Angie, say it louder. The anterior pituitary. So that's the hormones that are stimulating the ovaries to do their job. They're the tropic hormones. So they're basically kicking the ovaries, saying, get going, start secreting estrogen, progesterone, ovulate your egg, it's time to go, right? We said LH stimulates ovulation. Well, as the ovaries age, they become sluggish and less responsive to these hormones. So as a result of that, and there's fewer eggs, viable eggs, because they've been around for 50 years, right? Because these eggs were formed during fetal development. So they become less responsive. There's the, the egg quality goes down, and the chance of pregnancy drops significantly. After age 43, I want to say, the chance of pregnancy is very low after 43. It does happen, definitely, but the chances are very low. 40 to 41, the chances are still pretty good. And there are I, a lot of people I know that have had babies at 40, 41, you know, spontaneously. I'm one. <laughs> so I have a nine-year-old at home. <laughs> um, and she was a surprise. She tells everybody that. So we, we never say accident. We say surprise. Um, but yeah, so, so this, this process happens. And by 50, the ovaries are really starting to kind of shut down. So um, a woman might still be ovulating. She might still be having regular periods at this time. But the quality of that egg is down. And uh, the hormones that would support pregnancy decrease. So um, we can test for this process. In some women, it happens sooner. Some women in their 40s start menopause. So we can test for this. And what would we look for, do you think? What hormone would be too high or too low? Estrogen would be low, OK? That's one thing we could test. But there's an even more accurate one. Look, at, Think about the gonadotropins. FSH is what stimulates the ovary to do its job. And, if the, and the ovaries are saying, no, think of FSH keeps kicking it. Come on, let's go, ovaries, do your thing. And the ovaries are, can't do it anymore. So what are the FSH levels going to be like in women that are high? Yeah, and that's one of the key indicators when a woman come, comes in and says, yes, I'm just you know, sweating every night, and the sheets are soaked, and I'm moody, and I have an insomnia, and my periods are all, all over the place. I said, let's check an FSH level. And they'll look at that. And if it's really high, that's an indication that menopause is starting. If it's normal, then they can say, no, you're good. You have good ovarian reserve, we call that. And we say, you know, chances of pregnancy are good. Because there are some women that get married late in life, right? And they try to have a child. And the fertility does decline after 35. <clears throat> so um, they're going to look at FSH levels and say, let's see what your ovarian reserve is. What are your FSH levels? Is it worth doing some advanced techniques to get pregnant? Because there are you know, women that require in vitro fertilization to get pregnant. Um, they don't want to waste their time if someone has unresponsive ovaries because they have to hyperstimulate the ovaries, get lots of eggs, and then in, you know, fertilize them with sperm and get lots of embryos growing. And then they pick the best two. At Gunderson, they only do twins. But if you're Octomom, they pick the best eight and put them all in there. And all eight survived with Octomom, right? Some had problems, right? Some had cerebral palsy and, and issues. So that's an eth ethical thing. But Gunderson only does twins, so they'll take two. I think maybe you can talk them into three, but the most common is two. And if both take, you know, there's lots of twins being born to people that undergo IVF or in vitro fertilization. So they're not going to waste their time. It's a very expensive process, like twenty to forty thousand dollars per cycle, and they don't want to waste their money if a person has really high FSH levels and they don't have good eggs to get. And some women, like in the, you know, Hollywood, that are having, you know, like Joan London, didn't she have a baby at like fifty or something like that? Um, they don't tell you, but they're using donated eggs. So they're using eggs from younger women that are donating for people to have, you know, maybe, the, maybe they're using their partner's sperm to fertilize that egg, but they're using donated eggs. They're not using 50-year-old eggs. Yes? What exactly is perimenopause? <clears throat> perimenopause is the period leading up to menopause. And that's where people start to feel some of the symptoms of menopause. But menopause is when the period stops. So this is what we have to highlight. I'm glad you asked that. <clears throat> So menopause is when the period has stopped. 
and when they say a woman has not had a period for six months to a year, she's officially done in menopause. So <clears throat> perimenopause, peri means around. So when you're around that time, that can start anywhere in the 40s, early 50s. The average age of actual menopause is 55. So people are in that phase. So what they find is um, insomnia, quality of sleep goes down quite a bit. Um, um, heavier periods, sometimes more painful periods, um, night sweats, and increased headaches, joint pain, um, fatigue, brain fog. Don't those all sound wonderful? <laughs> Makes you want to take a class of A&P when you're in the menopausal stage, right? No. <laughs> you're what? You're batting 100. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what can you do to counter those effects, right? Because I worry about that myself. I'm getting into that age, and I know other, like I'll be talking to some nurses at work that I work, that work on my floor that are in menopause, and we'll be just chatting, and all of a sudden I just see sweat dripping down their face. I'm like, oh my gosh. And you don't want to say anything because they know what's happening, but they obviously don't want to talk about it. So we're like, <laughs> dripping. Um, I, that's going to happen to me, and I'm going to be in front of a class of students, you know, I'll be peeling layers. Um, but what they recommend is actually there's, remember, I, did I talk about estrogens in here, about phytoestrogens, how soybeans are an artificial source of estrogen? That um, they recommend that women are in that perimenopausal stage, that they've done studies and found that drinking soy milk, eating edamame, which are just little soybean beans, little, they look like beans, but they're green. Um, I make those salads, they're actually really good. Um, that can help kind of deal with the symptoms of, of menopause or perimenopause. Exercise is really good dealing with perimenopause because anxiety levels go up, moodiness, depression levels go up. And think about most of your homes. Think about yourselves, you girls that are in your 20s and in the upper teens still. Your moms are probably in their 50s, right? And you were probably like a senior in high school a couple years ago. And how are you getting along? Pretty well? <laughs> moms and daughters? And sons, when everybody's hormones are all out of control, it's kind of a bad mix, isn't it? Um, so just understanding that, and marriages struggle during this time too because women are less tolerant of the difficulties that might exist in a marriage. So just being aware of those things. And they've also done studies that some women who take Prozac in the week around their period when the hormones are really kind of out of whack um, can cope with some of these perimenopausal symptoms. Or even just going on uh, a mild antidepressant through the perimenopausal time can help with sleep, can help coping with anxiety. It's not a sign of failure or weakness, right? It's just a matter of how we cope with this temporary change. Okay, so um, they're, low, they're not responding to the gonadotropins. We already talked about that. Estrogen levels are low, right? And FSH levels are, right, increased FSH. But then, like anything, when there's no response, FSH will give up, the anterior pituitary will give up, and will no longer secrete high levels of SFH, FSH. <clears throat> so because of this problem with estrogen, again, we talked about some of the symptoms, um, remember, dryness so we know the progesterone helps keep the cervical mucus moist and promotes you know just a healthy reproductive tract so vaginal dryness is a symptom of, of menopause and like I, I think I said this before too so when, a, when an older elderly woman is raped that's very damaging the vaginal wall is thin so that um, decreases so intercourse can be more painful, less desirable. The libido, the desire for intercourse goes down in females, especially in the perimenopausal. That's another symptom of, of around the perimenopausal period is there's just less desire for sex. And again, partners you know, are gonna be a little disappointed with that. So it's good to kind of just know the physiology of what perimenopause means and menopause. Um, cholesterol levels. Remember, estrogen helps with cholesterol. So what happens to cholesterol levels after menopause? They increase, yep. And bone density decreases because estrogen stimulates osteoblasts. So if osteoblast activity is decreased, we're not building new bone. So how do we stimulate our bone after menopause? 
vitamin D, making sure we're getting good vitamin D and calcium in our diet, and weight-bearing exercise. Yeah, so it's really important to, to move and be active. And the weight-bearing exercise is also gonna help the cholesterol. So, um, so the people that don't move around after menopause that just become overweight and sedentary, their chance of heart attack goes up cons considerably. Um, and if, let's say, they're not gaining weight, let's say they're just a little old lady who just does putters to and from the kitchen counter and just lives in her little tiny apartment and she's 95 pounds and not getting exercise, what is she at risk for? Yeah, falling, because weakening osteoporosis, uh, weakening bones due to osteoporosis and lack of estrogen stimulating osteoblasts, falling down, breaking a hip. And what happens, they find, is people are standing at the counter, they break their hip and fall. So the bones become so weak that they just crack and they fall. So, and uh, that's a number one reason that people enter the nursing home and pass away shortly thereafter, is just the failure to thrive or decline um, due to a hip fracture. And Laura, you work in a nursing home. Do you see that? Do you see people pass pretty quickly when they come in after hip fracture? Depends. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's good. Yeah, because if you think about how that, that hip fits into the acetabulum of the pelvis, isn't it coming in at an angle? So when you stand up, the whole upper torso is resting on that neck of the femur. And at that spongy bone that breaks down with osteoporosis, it just cracks, and that's that. So that's why you always have to have a gait belt. You can't get you know, lazy in the nursing home or hospital environment with an elderly little lady like that, or anybody, a man too. They'd fall and break their hip too, or break their hip and fall. You never know when that's gonna happen, so you gotta have a hang on to these people. <clears throat> All right, so men get to look forward to enlargement of that prostate, right? So the prostate gets bigger leading to urinary retention, difficulty with urination, um, increases the risk for cancer, and then if we remove it, it causes urinary leakage, and it also can cause for sexually active men a retrograde ejaculation, which means instead of the sperm coming down the duct and exiting the end of the penis, it actually goes backward, because when it enters into that ejaculatory duct, if the prostate's not there, it can go backward and infect the bladder. Because what do we know about the sperm and the semen? Does the male body recognize that as self? We said no, right, because of those tight junctions in the seminiferous tubules and because sperm don't arrive on the scene in the male until 13, 14. So when the body suddenly just has sperm somewhere that's not supposed to be, it forms antibodies and causes an immune response. So that can cause issues and inflammation of the bladder if there's sperm backing up into the bladder. So that concludes 